All of the people in Tokyo were in a hurry to get to work on time. The train was packed with people when all of a sudden, a young Japanese girl got up and gave an old man her seat. She couldn't stand the thought of him having to stand the whole time. But something amazing happened when she found out who the man was. The girl giving up her seat was an amazing sight caught on camera. But then something surprising happened. Tina, a student, took the subway every day to get to school. Finding a seat wasn't just a nice to have, it was a must because she had a long drive. She quickly looked around the train car as she got on. There was only one place left that wasn't taken. She would not have gotten the seat at all if she had come a few seconds later. As soon as she saw an empty seat, Tina sank down in relief. She was glad for a moment to calm down before starting her busy day as an art student. She sighed and put her heavy bag on the floor. She had no idea that her life was about to take a sudden turn. The metro came to a stop at the next station. An old man stood at the end of a long line of people. He just made it on time and looked for a seat in the crowded car. His attention was not being paid to. Though, as the metro was very crowded, Tina couldn't believe that no one offered to help the old man. It didn't matter how much she liked her seat. She stood up and said, Here, mister, please take my seat. The man looked at her with admiration and sat down. But it was hard for him. As he sat down, he mumbled something that Tina didn't fully understand. She smiled and told him it wasn't a problem. It looked like the man wasn't used to seeing such acts of kindness on his face. Did she know this guy? Tina looked over her shoulder a few times during the ride to see how the old man was doing. But each time he was already looking at her. That's weird, did they know each other? That's why he was acting so strange, right? Had she forgotten something? That didn't seem likely, though. The man kept staring at her the whole way, though. Tina didn't mind at first and tried to ignore it because she thought he would stop. But he never did, she asked herself, what is he doing? Under her breath, he had a hard time getting up and leaving when the metro got to his stop. If Tina saw this, she forgot about how she felt and helped him again. When they got outside, he was grateful and told her have a nice day. When Tina got back on the train, she smiled when she thought about how strange her morning had been. She got off the train at her stop and realized all of a sudden that she had left her bag behind. Fearing for her safety, she ran back onto the train to get it, and when she did, she felt calm. She looked at something else when she picked up her bag, though, there was an envelope on the seat where the older man had been sitting. When she picked it up, she was confused because there was nothing written on the outside. It looks like the old man forgot about it. She didn't know what to do so she looked around. Since she couldn't go back, she chose to pocket the envelope. After getting off the subway, Tina put the envelope in the front pocket of her bag and began walking to school. In her spare time, she thought about trying to find the old man because she thought the letter probably belonged to him. But she had no idea where this would lead her in the end. In her mind, Tina kept going back to the package as she walked to school. What might be inside, should she look? She reminded herself by shaking her head that she shouldn't bother someone's privacy. On the other hand, opening it might help her find him. Before she got to school, her thoughts kept going back and forth. She had no idea that everything was about to change. Though Tina had just arrived at school, she saw a group of girls running toward her. One of them yelled, Tina, you're on TV. Tina didn't understand how she was on TV. The girls pulled her into an empty classroom and showed her the video before she could ask anything. Tina was shocked to see in the video that the subway car she had been in a few moments before was visible. The security footage showed the elderly man being assisted by a young girl. Her, off the metro, the old man then appeared in the video, saying something incredible like, I really need to get back this very important envelope that I accidentally left on the subway. Tina's hand automatically went to her bag's front pocket when she watched. The old man had, in fact, left the envelope behind, and her suspicion had been correct. However, the video had not yet ended. Next, it showed Tina reaching into the seat to retrieve the envelope. The elderly man, who appeared hopeless, reappeared in the video, to the girl who found it, please reach out to me. He begged. Tina didn't hesitate to start running in the direction of the subway. 
She had seen the station that the man had described in the video. It was the one nearest to her school, only a short ride away. Perhaps the man remained there. Tina made sure the envelope remained in her bag's front pocket before settling into her seat on the subway. She was shocked to see that the envelope wasn't sealed. She gasped in surprise as she peered inside out of curiosity. What? Tina's eyes grew big and she exclaimed. There was a huge, beautifully crafted key inside the envelope. Wondering what this key may unleash. She scowled. Tina could see why it was so important to the elderly man. It looked precious. The realization that she was almost to the correct station filled her with a sense of urgency. The metro stopped at the station she had seen in the video a little while later. Okay, what now? A murmured to herself, Tina said, with six platforms, the station was fairly spacious. Would this old man be here still? If so, where might he be located? With a determined demeanor, she began sprinting across one of the platforms, her heart palpating with each stride. She noticed him right as she started to feel pressured. The elderly man was seated on a bench across the station. She ran to embrace him. Pardon me, Tina murmured, gasping for air. I wanted to return this envelope that you left on the train. The elderly man raised his head, startled and wide-eyed. He said, thank you, young lady, with a tone full of appreciation. He said, this key is very special to me. As she gave him the envelope, my family has owned it for many years, so I was afraid I might lose it forever. Relieved to have been of assistance, Tina grinned. She remarked, I'm just happy I could return it. Grinning in return, the elderly guy said that she reminded him so much of his granddaughter since she was always willing to lend a hand. With a flush, Tina answered that it was not at all troublesome. Then an amazing event occurred, before Tina could stop herself. Her curiosity overcame her and she blurted out. What does the key open? Startled by her own audacity, she clapped her palms over her lips. But the elderly guy simply grinned. He said, if you'd like, I can show you. Tina nodded in agreement, her curiosity piqued by the mystery. Still, she couldn't help but question the old man's motives for inviting a stranger to witness something so meaningful to him when they strolled together. A growing sense of unease washed over her as she pondered its peculiarities. We can assume the elderly man had good intentions. In an effort to calm her mounting fears, Tina started probing the old man with questions. Much to her astonishment, he was surprisingly forthcoming with his responses. Her concerns were immediately allayed when the man revealed that the key belonged to a bank vault that housed his family's treasures. He could tell she was genuinely curious. So he told her he wanted to show it to her. Uncertain of her next move, Tina paused for thought. Tina was hesitant at first, but eventually consented to go with the elderly man. Silently, they got on the metro and rode along. The elderly man clutching a little bag to his chest. His fists tightened around the key as though it were priceless. A fact that Tina noted. Upon arriving at their destination, the elderly gentleman led her through a complex network of hallways to the bank. He nodded to the bank manager when they were escorted down the corridor to an area housing a sizable vault. The elderly man struggled with the key after the manager departed, but he managed to unlock the vault with a loud click. Upon hearing the hefty vault door swing open, Tina let out a gasp. Among the several boxes were items made of gold and valuable stones. However, it was a little but lovely Japanese sculpture perched on a pedestal in the corner that captured her eye. An unexpected action was taken by the old man upon noticing Tina's fixation with the statue. He gingerly removed it from its perch and presented it to her. This is a small gesture of my appreciation. He explained, it caught Tina off guard. She didn't think she deserved such a reward as she had merely acted in accordance with her conscience. The elderly man persisted, even though she tried to refuse by shaking her head. I couldn't have retrieved it without you. He said, the statue was graciously welcomed by Tina, who was overcome with gratitude. The genuine value, she felt, lay in the kindness it symbolized, even though she knew it was precious. Neither of them knew it would be their final meeting, but she sensed a deep connection to the elderly guy and knew this meeting was important. A statue's value piqued Tina's interest, so she had it evaluated. After a few months, 
she decided to consult an expert to find out its true value and historical significance. The expert was mesmerized by the elaborate carvings and disclosed that the statue, which dates back to the era and is worth more than $110,000, was made by a famous artist. The historical importance and monetary worth of the sculpture shocked Tina. After hearing the appraiser's recommendation, Tina was very careful with the monument. On her way home, she thought about the family history of the object and how it had been handed down over the years. It was a privilege to own such a priceless artifact, and she swore to hold it in the highest regard forever. Even if she couldn't sell it, that wasn't the final chapter. When she returned home around eight months later, she had a feeling something wasn't right. She stepped into the living room to find her room window ajar, and a chilly wind blew through the hall. With a swift look, she noticed that her figurine was no longer on display in the cabinet. It had been taken. Sitting in her room, Tina gazed at the vacant spot where her sculpture had been placed. To her, the statue was an irreplaceable relic. It represented her heritage, and the theft had broken her heart, leaving behind a message that read, You'll never see it again. Without any idea of what to do, she felt entirely powerless. Then the statue's donor, an elderly guy, sprang to mind, in the vain hope that he could be of use. She took up the phone and called him. They were in constant contact with one other. Hi there? Over the telephone, the man's voice cracked. It was Tina. She introduced herself. Help me out, please. The thief made off with my statue. The other end of the line fell silent for a moment. As soon as I can, I will be there, the elderly guy said. The elderly man showed up at Tina's residence within the specified time frame. As promised, he immediately said, Tell me everything, upon his arrival. As Tina went over everything, the old man paid close attention. His inquiries ranged from whether her window could be accessed from the outside to if she was aware of anyone who could be interested in stealing it. After much investigation, he came to the conclusion that the criminals were probably black market sellers. Particularly those dealing in stone relics. The elderly man was well versed in the underground market and possessed an extensive collection. When Tina asked him to help her get her statue back, he said he would. The old man went to work in the days that followed. He leveraged his connections, spoke with people, and placed calls. Tina was astounded at how fast he was able to locate leads. He appeared to know everyone in the industry and had access to information that others were unable to. The elderly man eventually received a lead. He had heard that a statue that fit the description had lately been acquired by a group of traders. Tina and the elderly guy traveled together to the nearby city where these traders were based. They had to begin looking for the monument as soon as they got here. But the elderly guy had no contacts in this new city. Now what do we do? Tina inquired, but she wasn't happy with his answer at first. The elderly man gave it some thought, and then a small smile crept across his lips. He remarked, it's actually pretty simple. Tina turned to face him, wondering how something so easy could be. Then the elderly guy told them that all they had to do was go to the area of the city that was the shadowiest. They went to dingy clubs and discreetly asked people who knew someone about the underground market about the stolen statue. The elderly man utilized his familiarity with these circles to learn more details about the traders. But he had forewarned Tina, so they had to use extreme caution. Finding the ideal persons to speak with required careful thought and a lot of time. They came upon someone with important information one day when they were in a questionable pub. Though Tina's heart beat, the old man asserted himself. Tina clutched her skirt and glanced around uneasily. She was being watched intently by other patrons in the bar while the old man conversed with someone who appeared suspicious. She whispered, this isn't good, and when she felt a hand on her shoulder, she almost leapt out of her skin. The elderly man was the one. Let's go, he said softly, and Tina went outside with him. After they had returned to the street, the old guy disclosed that he had discovered the dealer's hiding place, which was a warehouse outside of the city. A wave of hope filled Tina. They were off to get her statue. When they finally got at the warehouse in the dark, they noticed a number of eerie figures moving within. Tina waited in the car while the elderly man approached warily. After engaging the traders in discussion, 
he soon succeeded in persuading them to part with the statue. The crooks had no idea that the negotiations were just a means of distraction to keep them busy. The elderly man had informed the police of the situation and called them in the interim. Soon after, sirens began to sound, and the robbers were caught. Tina soon found herself in possession of the statue once more. The old man and she were both ecstatic that their search had turned up the statue and the thieves. Though Tina was unsure of how to pay the elderly guy back, he was happy that the statue had been given back to its proper owner. Together, they made the long journey home, growing close. After watching the first story above, do you have any thoughts? Feel free to share your opinions in the comments section. Now, let's watch another similar story. Pujari had his first job as a general helper at a little restaurant in South Mumbai, close to Babanath Temple. When he was just 11 years old, his starting salary was a meter 4 rupees per month. The value of hard work was instilled in Pujari from a young age, and her drive led her to seek out greater roles. Pujari quit his job after two years to work as a waiter at the Bombay Port Trust Canteen, where he made 6 rupees a month. He saw this as his chance to really learn about finances and consumer tastes. Pujari had much compassion for those going through the same things she had because she also came from humble beginnings. Despite working over 18 hours a day and going to night school to further his education, his commitment to hard work remained unwavering. Throughout this period, Pujari cultivated a deep love for reading and accumulated a library of more than a thousand volumes. At a juice and snack center close to the country's technological hub, Pujari was approached by an old relative who lived far away, asking for his assistance. This presented him with a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Pujari learned the fundamentals of entrepreneurship from this experience. In the same year, he made the decision to launch his own business. In spite of her meager means, Pujari erected an improvised juice shop consisting of a little wooden table, a hand-cranked juicer and a handmade sign advertising a variety of freshly squeezed drinks. His choice of name for the stand was Sook Cigar, which translates to Ocean of Happiness. After a long and fruitful journey, Sook Cigar became a fully registered brand and served as an inspiration to entrepreneurs all around the globe, customers in the middle and lower classes who appreciated the cost and quality of Pujari's juices and, more recently, cuisine were largely responsible for Sook Cigar's success, which was recently commemorated on its 50th anniversary. Pujari was already a famous person after associating in Hollywood and the entertainment industry, as well as politicians, government employees, and prosperous business people. Pujari found herself in the limelight as famous guests became regulars. Pujari rose a legendary status in Mumbai as the years passed. Many looked up to him and linked his success to the elevated status of once popular street delicacies. Now even high-end hotels serve what was formerly considered poor street food, and Pujari finally got his due. After establishing his empire on a little wooden table, Pujari went on to open 20 Sook cigar eateries in various locations throughout India and the Middle East, in addition to a large hotel, a mall and an ice cream plant were all under his ownership in Bangalore. In spite of his modest origins, his entrepreneurial endeavors managed to provide employment for a thousand people. The original focus of Sook Cigar was food, but the company has since expanded into many other cuisines, including as vegetarian alternatives, Chinese, Mexican, Punjabi, Italian, and many more. Pujari took his idea a step further in Bangalore, elevating the city's dining scene with the addition of a four-story food hall featuring fresh pastries and escalator services. Pujari started his own bakery and dairy to meet the demand for his milkshakes and ice creams after he encountered trouble obtaining bread. In addition to his well-deserved success in business, Pujari is a married man with three boys all of whom contribute significantly to his extensive network. He cared deeply about providing for his family and protecting them from the difficulties he endured. The presence of multinational fast food chains was a challenge. But Pujari maintained faith in the market's potential and the idea that all enterprises might succeed. Despite his achievements on the European front, Pujari had even grander plans. 
he wanted to grow beyond the Middle East and India. Pujari thinks that Sukh cigar cuisine ought to be accessible to everyone in the planet, even now. He continues to broaden his horizons by opening additional locations abroad in places like the US and Canada in addition to Mumbai, Bangalore, and Delhi. As someone who began with just 4 rupees a month, Pujari has personal experience with the effects of poverty, he is dedicated to ensuring that youngsters obtain education and the possibilities that he himself did not completely enjoy by giving back to the community. He thinks that instead of working long hours, kids should be learning at school. In his home village, Pujari built a free community center. He also implemented educational programs and provided medical assistance, paid time off, and seed money to employees who wished to launch their own enterprises. Pujari met George Fernandez, a prominent person who first tasted the delicious flavor at Pujari's first restaurant, in the early years of Sook Cigar. For Pujari, Fernandez's arrival to the restaurant signaled the beginning of a major network after a long day of non-stop cab rides. Throughout his political career, Fernandez remained a devoted friend and customer. He went on to become a well-known trade unionist leader and defense minister. Pujari's narrative demonstrates to us the value of perseverance. His story of going from making four rupees a day to extraordinary success shows that hard work and perseverance pay off. His example inspires us to work hard, put our best into all we do, and take pleasure in the fruits of our labors. After watching the stories above, do you have any thoughts? Feel free to share your opinions in the comments section. If you enjoyed our video, Please like, subscribe, and share our channel. That all about today's stories. See you next time.